on general farm commodities and risk management regarding an update on the financial health of farm country will come to order. During the Farm Bill debate, we heard a good bit about the relatively high prices farmers were receiving for their crops and the suggestion was made by at least some folks that it was a good time as any to, dis, uh, to discontinue the Farm Bill. Now that we're in year two of the Farm Bill, I thought it would be appropriate to take a look at the financial conditions in farm country today and assess what might have happened had those folks had their way. Farm prices for many crops have dropped dramatically since the Farm Bill debate. Input costs continue to rise. Mother Nature continues to wreak havoc on some regions of the country. Foreign competitors are sharply increasing their subsidies, tariffs, and non-tariff trade barriers. And sadly, even the U.S. government is adding hurdles for farmers and ranchers to overcome. The EPA is pushing new and costly regulations. Some in this country are standing in the way of critical tax relief, ranging from a permanent Section 179 and bonus depreciation to repeal of the death tax. Some have even proposed to eliminate stepped-up basis, which is absolutely essential to passing on the family farm. Today's panel will provide valuable insights on how these and other factors are impacting America's farmers and ranchers and speak to the importance of U.S. farm policy. I'm looking forward to hearing their testimony, but before we go to our first panel, I want to recognize my good friend, the ranking member, uh, my friend from Minnesota, Mr. Walsh, for any comments he may have. Well, I thank the chairman and uh, thank the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Conway, again, uh, for, uh, for holding these important hearings. Uh, I'd like to welcome all our witnesses here today and thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to engage in this and help us understand. I'd, I'd like to give a special uh, thank you and shout out to my, my friend and constituent, uh, uh, Kevin Papp from Southern Minnesota. If you want to talk about dedication to being here today, uh, it's Kevin and uh, Julie's anniversary today and in two days his son Andy's getting married. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't envy you when you go back home, Kevin, but thank you so much. Uh, you are, uh, you are dedicated to getting this done. Um, one thing's clear. It's something I think we all agree on on this. When the farm economy is healthy, Main Street economy is healthy. As lawmakers, we rely on boots on the ground expertise to help us navigate the proper course for ag policy. We write the farm bill for the bad times, not the good. The tough part is that farming is not monolithic and one size fits all. When commodity prices are down, livestock prices may be up and other things go in that direction also. The financial health of the sector is also significantly influenced by external factors. Drought, flood, disaster, and disease all have an impact which ripple through our, uh, our entire economy, especially our rural economies. In the Midwest uh, and in Minnesota specifically, we're facing a calamity right now with the onset of avian flu. This outbreak places a financial emotional strain on the producers impacted. Um, and you don't even have to have a flock to test positive on this. The stress created by the possibility of losses out there. I heard one uh, producer say it's like living in a constant tornado warning every single day. Um, we'll continue to fight to ensure the resources are in place to combat this and, and other disasters coming up. When addressing the financial health of farm country, I do think there are a few universal themes we can be broadly applied. First and foremost, risk management is the key. Without robust and effective programs, the industry will falter. Second, we need to do everything we can to promote the next generation of farmers by providing strong risk management programs, read readily available credit, and world-class research and education. Finally, the sustainable health of our soil and resources is paramount. Farmers are some of the best conservationists in this regard. It just makes good business sense. We must continue to provide the tools to maintain the health of our resources. With that, I'd like to thank the Chairman again for holding these important hearings, and I really look forward to hearing from our witnesses. I yield back. I thank the gentleman and uh, would recognize the full committee chairman, Mr. Conway, if he has any opening remarks. No opening remarks. Just uh, thank the witnesses for being here. I look forward to their testimony. Thank the chairman, and I would remind uh, members that they will be recognized for questioning in order of seniority for members who are present at the start of the hearing. After that, members will be recognized in order of their arrival. Appreciate their understanding. Um, I want to introduce the panel really quick. I'm going to go through four, and then I will defer to Mr. Nagabauer for just a minute. But we have a great panel today, and I think we're going to get some great insight as to what's happening at home with uh, regard to implementation of the Farm Bill. First, let me welcome Mr. Nathan Kaufman, or Dr. Nathan Kaufman, rather, Assistant Vice President, Omaha Branch Executive, Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, Omaha, Nebraska. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, Mr. Paul T. Combs from Kennett, Missouri. He's a, a rice, soybean, corn, and wheat producer in addition to being a farm equipment dealer. Thank you, Mr. Combs, for being here. Uh, Mr. Dow Brantley um, is uh, from my district. Pleased to have him here. Uh, he is a very diversified producer from England, Arkansas, produces cotton corn, soybeans, and rice. And finally, um, Mr. Walls, I would defer to you to introduce uh, your constituent if you would like. Well, as I said, Kevin is a producer, a longtime producer out in Garden City, Minnesota, in southern Minnesota. Blue Earth County uh, has been uh, 
a leading voice in ag and is also our current uh, Minnesota Farm Bureau president. Um, so thank you, Kevin. And finally, Mr. Nagelbauer, I recognize you to make an introduction. Well, I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing. Uh, the title of this hearing is Update on Financial Health of Farm Country, and I can't think of anybody that knows more about the financial health of farm country than my good friend and constituent, Steve Verrett. Steve has been the executive vice president of Plains Cotton Growers for 18 years, but he's been farming for 38 years and plants all of the major crops in our area, cotton, sorghum, wheat, sunflowers. Uh, there's one little uh, th trivia note here that's something that Steve and I have in common and that is that we both got a uh, degree from Texas Tech in accounting and so I'm glad to have Steve here today and I appreciate him uh, taking time out of his busy time because uh, what what you don't know is it's been raining uh, non-stop in, in Lubbock, Texas and in Texas uh, and this is planting time and so Steve is taking valuable time away from his planting time to come up here and testify and I appreciate that. Wow, we have, I know of at least four then CPAs in the room. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Combs is also a CPA. Our committee chairman is a CPA. I don't know what to do with all these tax guys in the room at one time. But um, thank you, uh, members of our panel. We appreciate you being here. Uh, just one quick note, uh, just as a reminder, you have five minutes and you should, our lights should be working. Once you see the yellow lights, just like when you're driving, step on the gas. And when you see red, stop. And uh, we'll do that in the interest of making sure all of our members have time to address the questions and we want to get as much information from you as possible. So with that, I'll introduce our first panelist, uh, Dr. Nathan Kaufman, Assistant Vice President, Omaha Branch Executive, Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Uh, Mr. Kaufman or Dr. Kaufman, you are recognized. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. My name is Nathan Kaufman and I'm an economist and Omaha Branch Executive with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City a regional reserve bank that has long devoted significant attention to U.S. agriculture. In my role, I lead several efforts to track the agricultural and rural economy, including a regional agricultural credit survey and the Federal Reserve System's Agricultural Finance Data Book, a national survey of agricultural lending activity at commercial banks. I am pleased to share with you the following information on recent developments in the financial conditions in U.S. agriculture. Before I begin, let me emphasize that my statement represents my view only and is not necessarily that of the Federal Reserve System or any of its representatives. The outlook for the U.S. agricultural economy has shifted significantly over the past two years, following several years of historically high farm income, primarily driven by strong demand for agricultural products and high commodity prices. Farm income has dropped considerably since 2013. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Net farm income in 2015 is projected to be about 43% less than the record high set in 2013. The drop in farm income has primarily been due to lower prices of major U.S. row crops, combined with production costs that have remained persistently high. For example, corn prices are currently about 50% less than in 2013, and soybean prices have dropped more than 30% during the same time frame. Despite the lower commodity prices, however, input costs have remained relatively high, causing profit margins to weaken notably over the past two years. Quarterly surveys of agricultural banks conducted by regional Federal Reserve banks have also pointed to reduced farm income. According to the Kansas City Fed survey, farm income has declined in every quarter since mid-2013 when compared with the same quarter in the preceding year. Bankers surveyed by other Federal Reserve districts have reported similar reductions in farm income despite extraordinarily high profit margins in U.S. cattle, hog, and dairy sectors in 2014. Weaker farm income and reduced cash flow, particularly in the crop sector, have also caused farmland prices to decline from their recent record highs. After posting annual gains of 25 to 35 percent between 2010 and 2012, Federal Reserve surveys show that farmland values have steadily decreased over the past year in Iowa, Illinois, Nebraska, and Minnesota. And these are four states that collectively account for more than half of total U.S. corn production. Ongoing declines in farm income and reduced levels of working capital have caused the financial condition of conditions of crop producers to worsen recently. Federal Reserve surveys show that farm loan repayment rates at commercial banks have steadily weakened since 2013 in states concentrated in row crop production. In a March 2015 survey of agricultural credit conditions conducted by the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, more than 60% of responding banks reported a modest deterioration in the financial conditions of crop producers relative to the previous year. As cash flow has declined, more producers have also needed external financing to pay for operating expenses and capital purchases. 
The Federal Reserve's Agricultural Finance Data Book, included with my written testimony, shows that the volume of new short-term farm loan originations has increased by an annual average of 20 percent since the beginning of 2014. Increased loan demand has also been supported by livestock loans for the purchase of feeder cattle where prices remain near historical highs. To briefly summarize, the risk associated with agricultural production in the U.S. appears to have increased since 2013 and through 2014, particularly in row crop production. Farmers with especially high production costs and high levels of debt will likely face additional financial stress in the coming months if the current environment and crop sector profit margins persists. Although a farm crisis on the scale of the 1980s seems unlikely at this point, there does appear to be growing concern among agricultural lending institutions that the level of financial stress in the sector overall may intensify over the next six to 12 months. This concludes my formal remarks and I would be happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. I uh, thank the gentleman for his testimony and recognize uh, Mr. Paul Combs for five minutes. Chairman Crawford, uh, Ranking Member Waltz, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding this hearing on the financial health of farm country and for inviting me to testify. As a producer, agribusinessman, and bank director, I have a unique ability to observe the farm economy from multiple angles. I farm corn, rice, soybeans, and wheat in the Boot Hill of Missouri and own farm implement dealerships in southeast Missouri and northeast Arkansas. I'm a former member of the Board of Directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and I currently serve on the board of First National Bank in Kennett. In all of these capacities, I've seen the farm sector go from one of the bright spots in the economy less than two years ago to now limping along. In less than two years, the average price received for corn has fallen 44 percent, and all other major commodities have experienced a similar nosedive. The pain isn't only felt on the farm, but on the hundreds of other businesses like our family's equipment dealerships that rely on producers. My family owns and operates 11 dealerships and employs 185 people throughout southeast Missouri and northeast Arkansas. Our sales are down about 15 percent year over year, 2015 over 14, and I anticipate the sales to continue to stagnate or even get worse in the third and fourth quarters of 2015. Fortunately, in our area, many producers had the Ford contracted or hedge their 2014 crop at higher prices. However, there isn't an opportunity to, in the market to do the same in 2015, and in the face of low prices, one of the first areas that producers cut costs is in their equipment investments. Adding to the challenge is the uncertainty regarding tax policy. Section 179 and bonus depreciation are key tools producers utilize when making equipment purchases, and these provisions expired on January 1 of 2014 and were not retroactively extended until December 19th. Many of our customers held off on buying equipment until they knew for certain what provisions would be in place, and when they were finally extended, there wasn't enough time left in the year for a farmer to, have his, to take delivery of the equipment. We're in the same situation again this year with uh, 179 and bonus depreciation, and the higher limit in 179 and the bonus depreciation, and I hope that Congress can make permanent or at least extend these provisions early enough in the year so that farmers and businesses can be able to utilize them. During my tenure on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, I saw the effect that a vibrant agricultural sector can have on the economy of rural America. Despite the stagnation in the urban economies, many rural communities were insulated from the worst of the downturn thanks to a healthy farm economy. High commodity prices allowed producers to make those investments in land and equipment, and those dollars continued to turn over multiple times in our rural communities. However, today there's been an almost complete turnaround with the Economic Research Service at USDA predicting net farm income to fall 32 percent this year and be down 43 percent from the high in 2013. I've witnessed this firsthand as a board member of my local bank, which has a large farm loan portfolio. We've already seen many producers have to refinance the losses they incurred last year for periods of up to 10 years. Some of our farmers weren't able to qualify for traditional operating loans and were forced to go to FSA guaranteed loans or FSA subordinated loans, which can be the, the loans of last resort. And of the producers who were able to, to get crop loans for this year, many are barely able to cash flow and near, need near record yields to make, the, to make the loans work. Perhaps the only positive influence on this outlook in added uncertainty is the support provided by the Farm Bill, which I hope will weather us, help us weather the storm. Three years ago, I testified before the House Ag Committee, and we were in discussion of the needs for the 2012 Farm Bill. So I know how long and difficult process it was to get the bill completed, and I want to thank all of you 
for the bill that we have in helping ensure farmers have at least some measure of stability in a very unstable market. The modest support provided by the Farm Bill is vital, not just to producers that are the direct beneficiaries, but to all of the businesses that depend on agriculture. Effective farm policy gives producers, agribusinesses, and lenders the confidence we need to continue investing in our farms and obtaining credit to finance these investments. Overall, there appears to be some challenging times on the horizon for rural America and the farm economy. U.S. farm policy is absolutely critical to helping us weather the downturn and run our businesses. I want to thank each of you for your work in helping develop, preserve, and protect these policies. Thank you again for your leadership and the opportunity to offer my testimony this morning, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Combs. Uh, Mr. Verrett, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Waltz, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify. My name is Steve Verrett. My son and brother and I farm near Rawls, Texas, where we grow cotton, sorghum, and wheat. I'm also the Executive Vice President of Plains Cotton Growers and Treasurer of the Southwest Council of Agribusiness. This hearing is important because there's been a huge change in the farm economy between the time that you started the farm bill process and today. Cotton prices now are 70% lower than the high recorded in 2011 and down 30% compared to the highs in the succeeding three years. I speak in terms of cotton, but this plummet in prices is commodity wide. As a consequence, farmers across the country are facing very difficult times, even those who had experienced a stronger price rally and good production in recent years. For cotton growers, the price rally was not as strong or sustained. And in Texas, where we have been dealing with the string of severest level of drought, these times are extremely challenging because we have had little opportunity to build up financial reserves in order to get through this bear market. In order to benefit from stronger prices, you have to have a crop to sell. The stress is especially great for young farmers who have debt and little equity in their operations. And although we have faced four years of drought and the crop losses that come with it and the collapse in crop prices, our input costs are sticky and in most cases rising. The good Lord has answered our prayers this year, sending us desperately needed rainfall. But as you undoubtedly read, our cup is overflowing and many producers will not be able to get into the field to plant a crop in a timely fashion. Securing financing for 2015 was extremely challenging for many farmers in part because so many were carrying debt from the year before. For many Texas producers, there will be no room for error this year if they expect to secure financing for 2016. In light of this, I would say that the health of the farm economy is very precarious. This is especially true in my part of the country, but based on what I've heard from my fellow producers around the country, everybody is really praying for a price recovery, strong yields, and in many cases, both. Without a turnaround, those who have had a recent history of stronger prices and production will take on more financial water, while others less fortunate will be navigating serious financial straits. These conditions are not just affecting farm families, but people in cities like Amarillo and Lubbock and in smaller towns throughout Texas, even when their work has nothing to do with agriculture. Cotton is the number one cash crop in Texas, and Lubbock County is the largest cotton producing county in America. Cotton is an economic lifeblood in Texas. That's why the farm bill and crop insurance are not just for farmers and ranchers. This is why it mystifies me when some people can't or won't appreciate why we need both when the answer is staring them in the face. Without federal involvement in crop insurance, there would be no multi peril insurance on our crops. And without a farm bill, there would be no American response to record high and rising foreign subsidies and tariffs. There are five studies published in the last six months that describe in great detail how our trading partners are breaking their trade commitments. Their cheating is harming America's farmers and ranchers, hurting our economy, and costing us jobs. But I don't have to read a study to know that because as a farmer, I'm living it every day. When Communist China is paying its farmers $1.45 per pound for inferior cotton, while I am earning something on the line of 60 cents for very high quality cotton, something is not right. Communist China has a state-run economy, and for about the past decade, China had a policy of acquiring record stocks which sent world prices soaring. But overnight, Ch Chinese policy changed and sent world prices into the tank. Now USDA says that China is likely to unload these stocks depressing world prices and with no end in sight. 
with China and other countries with low-wage jobs claiming much of our textile industries, years ago, 80 to 85 percent of American cotton is exported. We are heavily dependent upon trade, but when it comes to the world cotton market, Communist China pulls nearly all the strings. What we have is a double-edged sword. First, even as you worked hard to cut $23 billion from the Farm Bill and still provide a safety net, all the other big players around the world were doubling down on their subsidies and protections, breaking their commitments. Our trade agreements give us a rules-based system, but we don't ever seem to enforce our rights. Second, our competitors go to Geneva and convince trade lawyers to arbitrarily change the rules that we agreed to in order to unfairly attack U.S. foreign policy. That's how the Brazil case happened. Still, I must support trade because as a major exporter, we have no choice. I would just like to see some effort at enforcement. Absent a free and open market or enforcement by our government to make it free and open, the Farm Bill offers American producers at least some tools to manage the risk of a market distorted by foreign subsidies and tariffs. The problem for cotton farmers if we, is we had to give up those tools for cotton lent in the 2014 Farm Bill in order to satisfy Brazil. There is no ARC or PLC on cotton lent. This is a huge problem for cotton farmers based on the economic havoc that I've just described because the cotton stacks insurance policy is designed to operate in a free market and not as a response to cheating by other countries. I pray that we can weather the current storm, but if conditions continue, we may need USDA to use the tools it has available under the Farm Bill to help mitigate this serious situation. I've given you a lot to think about, mainly bad news for cotton, and I apologize for that. But I understood this was the purpose of today's hearing. Still, I would be very remiss if I did not tell you how much I appreciate the members of this subcommittee and of the entire committee for defending American farmers and ranchers every day. We as producers do not say it enough, but we are truly grateful. Thank you very much. With that, I'd be glad to answer questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Verrett. Mr. Brantley, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Crawford, Ranking Member Walls, and members of the subcommittee, I'm honored uh, to have the opportunity to offer my views today on the current state of the agriculture economy. <clears throat> Again, my name is Dow Brantley, and I farm 9,500 acres of row crops in central Arkansas in the community of England. We grow rice, cotton, corn, and soybeans. I farm in partnership with my parents, two brothers, and our families, and I'm pleased to serve as chairman of the USA Rice Federation, the Arkansas Rice Federation, Arkansas Farmers. And, but today I'm going to try to offer my testimony as an individual diversified farmer from the Mississippi River Delta. Rice is our primary focus, and as you know, Mr. Chairman, Arkansas grows approximately 1.3 to 1.5 million acres of rice each year, which is about half of the U.S. rice crop. Rice production, transportation, and processing play important roles in our state by providing thousands of jobs in the Mississippi River Delta. Nationally, the U.S. rice industry contrib contributes $34 billion in annual economic activities. It provides jobs and, in and income for everyone involved in the value chain, contributing approximately 128,000 jobs. This year's rice crop is expected to bring about $3 a hundredweight less than the 2013 crop on top of rising input costs, which are all well beyond the control of the farmer. The stakes are higher and higher and the profit margins are continuing to shrink and in many cases are in the red today. For those unfamiliar with the crop, rice fields are flooded during the growing season to provide water that the plants need and to help control weeds. While drought during the growing season adds to the cost of labor and other flood management, we fortunately do not typically lose a crop due to drought. On the other hand, this year's planting period in Arkansas and surrounding areas has been hampered by unusually wet weather. Aside from battling Mother Nature, government interference is the biggest challenge that rice producers face as they deal with the plethora of factors affecting price beyond their control. As rice is the most government interfered crop in the world, the U.S. has difficulty competing with foreign governments who illegally subsidize their crops and participate in unfair trade negotiations. It is critical that the U.S. government continue to go after the bad actors that put our nation's rice producers at an unfair disadvantage. A study released last month on the global competitiveness of the U.S. rice industry by the U.S. ITC lays out these challenges in great detail. The key conclusions outline the 
pervasive extent of government involvement in global rice markets and the high level of foreign tariffs that keep out U.S. rice exports. U.S. ITC analysts conclude that U.S. rice production would be approximately 25 percent higher in the absence of global tariffs. In this sense, a big risk to the U.S. rice industry is not crop failure, as it may be for other, some other commodities, but rather than trade policies of our own and foreign governments. I believe the first order of business should be to right this wrong. I encourage committee members to read and consider two sets of comments referenced in my written testimony regarding the 2014 Farm Bill's actively engaged in farming proposed regulation. The proposal's requirements do not make good business sense and would come at a significant cost and thus be punitive to my family's operation, which was supposed to be exempt from any change. In summary, I appreciate the work of this committee in crafting the 2014 Farm Bill and the work you're doing to monitor the agriculture economy. I think it's critical that we maintain provisions that allow us to be competitive in the world's markets, distorted by high foreign subsidies and tariffs that contribute to the kind of depressed prices we have today, including necessary acts of enforcement towards foreign markets that operate illegally and put U.S. rice farmers at an unfair disadvantage. Without U.S. farm policies in place, the current economy would not prevent farmers from continuing to, to farm, but it would prevent future generations from becoming involved in farming operations, leaving our industry in peril. I want to leave my operation as a legacy for my children, and so we as an industry need to do all we can to invest in today's economy. Thank you for the opportunity to present my views today. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Papp, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity, members of the subcommittee. My name is Kevin Papp. As mentioned, I'm president of Minnesota Farm Bureau. But today, I would like to talk a little bit as a fourth generation family farmer. We raise corn, soybeans, and boys, boys being the most important crop. You know, sustainability is important in all of agriculture, but generational sustainability is the most important. You know, when I had this opportunity uh, presented on me, I consulted my banker, some other bankers, crop insurance agents, uh, farm management instructors, machinery dealers, and my neighbors. And most of the answers I got were all two-word answers. They were things like, it stinks, it's difficult, be aware, it's bleak, be ready. But I think when we talk about the financial condition of farm country, the two words everybody agrees on, it depends. It depends on your type of operation. If you're a crops guy in Minnesota, your income's down 65% from last year. If you're a dairy, you're up 200%. So it depends on the type. It depends, do you own or rent that land? It depends on your age, your equity. And most importantly, it depends on the weather. Um, it's already been mentioned as we are seeing 50 to $100 an acre losses in crops. Uh, we're spending our own cash to meet our cash flow losses. We've got working capital burn. Financial stress, it's here, it's real. It will be challenging for many. I do believe as well this is not the 1980s. I graduated from college in the 80s and started farming. We don't want to do that again. There is going to be a need for more FSA guaranteed loans. Will there be enough money? Um, it was mentioned uh, Minnesota turkeys. We're number one in turkeys. The avian influenza bird flu. Um, in 23 of our 87 counties, we've got 103 farms infected. 8,355,732 birds in Minnesota, over 41 million across the U.S. And to me as a corn and soybean farmer, my bottom line is thinking about one bird equals about one bushel of corn. What are we going to do with that nearly eight and a half million bushels, billion bushels that we need to worry about, million bushels? But it's not just financial stress, it's the emotional stress that was managed. It's the jobs, it's the dollars not spent on Main Street. Um, and it's real. At, uh, this weekend, a barn four miles from our farm was hit, puts us into that control area. You know, the one thing that this committee can do to help um, with the financial stress in farm country is the one thing important to everyone in agriculture, important to this committee, important enough it was in the title of your subcommittee, and that's risk management, crop insurance. You know, this public-private partnership of crop insurance, revenue insurance, is so important. It's critical to us as farmers. 
it lets us use that cash, uh, that, that crop as cash, as collateral, as we borrow the money. You know, really crop insurance is, is my banker's best friend. We always talk about beginning farmers and wanting to get that fifth generation going on our farm. One thing that's so important, certainly the, uh, the ability to purchase that crop insurance at a, at a reduced price is important. But what I heard from farm management instructors and bankers, if we want beginning farmers in agriculture, we want to have the ability to use realistic yields, to be able to transfer those yields um, to show a, a true picture. That means 190 bushel yield uh, compared to maybe 170 if you're a beginning farmer. That's $80 an acre. That maybe means loan or no loan. In conclusion, I want to, uh, as I visited with a, a good friend, uh, a farmer, a farm management instructor, Paul Lanou from Marshall, Minnesota, he was the first one when I asked, how would you describe it? He said, it stinks. His comments were, you know, we as farmers, we must understand our ratios. We must know where we are. We've got to be able to see this train wreck ahead of us. Because if we understand wh where we are, we manage the things we can manage, there's going to be a lot of opportunities ahead. All we have to do is hold it together to get through this. Again, I thank you for this opportunity and I'm happy to answer any questions. I thank the gentleman for his comments and uh, appreciate all of your testimony. Uh, I'm confident that we're going to get a lot out of this and we appreciate you being here today. I want to um, start questions. Um, First off, uh, to Mr. Combs, often cited indicators of the health of the farm economy are new and used farm equipment sales, kind of a barometer of what the farm economy is at any given time. Uh, what are you seeing in your equipment dealership and to what extent does that provide a future outlook that farmers in the area have? Well, as I mentioned, our, our sales are down about 15% year over year through April. Our concern is in the third and the fourth quarters. Uh, we, we sold a lot of equipment at the end of 14. It was delivered in 15 based on people that had their uh, commodities hedged in 14, and they hadn't done that in 15. And so I, I'm, I'm concerned that the third and fourth quarters in the first quarter of 2016 could, could be rough. Um, and, and I think 15% is the minimum that we're going to be down. All right? I, I think we're, we're at a, a, as good a place as we could finish if we could hold that 15% reduction. Okay. Well, I know, as I mentioned, I know you're a CPA, you're tracking these numbers pretty closely. Does that match up pretty well with national figures? Yes. Uh, the, the, the major manufacturers are forecasting anywhere from 15 to 25, and um, we're, we're prepared to go to 25. We hope it's not any more than that. So. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brantley, I was going to ask you about um, actively engaged. I'm going to defer to the ranking member but um, because I don't want to steal his thunder on that. But I would ask you this, and, and to all the, to the panelists, um, you guys are producers, and I know that um, one of the recurring themes we heard in, in testimony was uh, sort of the international rules violations that takes place as a matter of course with some of our um, uh, neighbors, uh, global neighbors. Is that lost on our in coffee shops? Are producers talking about that? Do they recognize, you know, how important that is to our farm economy? Can you give me a comment on that from from the turn row? Yeah, do, the question: Do farmers uh, recognize the importance of trade? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, especially in rice, where half of our commodity, our half of rice, is exported around the world. It, it, it's important day in and day out. The hot topics right now are Cuba and Iraq. Uh, we desperately need uh, a place to move this supply of rice. Uh, Cuba is uh, uh, a no-brainer for us in, uh, uh, in, in Arkansas or anywhere in the Mid-South. Uh, uh, we desperately need some help in Iraq uh, from trying to get their government uh, to, to buy our rice when we are the cheapest product uh, around the world. Okay. Mr. Brett, your comments? Um, I would say that producers in my area are very confused by all of it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times over the last eight to 10 months as we've had farm bill meetings and we discussed about the changes in the farm bill, the first question comes up is, why do we have to have a program that says, you know, you can't have any kind of price protection and we have to lower our loan and our major competitors don't fall under those same rules? They're very confused by all of it. And I'm you know, it's very difficult in trying to explain to them. Uh, sometimes I, I have a hard time understanding it myself, mm -hmm. but 
they're, they're very confused and they're, you know, they just don't get it. I mean, and, and rightly they don't get it. I don't get it either. And that's part of the problem that we have. Understood. Mr. Pat. You know, we're fortunate in this country we can grow more than we need. And uh, we need to uh, use those customers at 95% of the world that, that isn't the United States. I planted my 37th crop this spring. I know when I planted that soybean field, every other row of those soybeans, my soybeans, are leaving my state. I mean, our, our financial health depends on the demand, which is a relative of price. We've got to have that demand. We have to have that ability to get our products to the people that want them. Thank you. Dr. Kaufman, I'm not letting you out without a question. Um, and this, this won't be a difficult question at all. Where do you think interest rates are going? <laughs> So for questions pertaining to interest rates, I would refer directly to the Federal Open Market Committee statement on, on interest rates. <laughs> Let Chair Yellen respond to that. Well done. Well done. Okay, so I guess we'll, that's, uh, that's going to be your answer on the record. Um, I, t I appreciate, the, I appreciate your, your answers, gentlemen, and I'm sure you're going to get a lot of good questions. We'll start by recognizing Ranking Member, my friend, Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank all of you. I, uh, I said I'm always so impressed with the competency and the experience, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's helpful to us, and the, the complexity starts to show up. And uh, if, if, if it's complex for the folks that sit on this committee, uh, the challenges amongst uh, our colleagues, and then by extension, the American public. So I wanted to thank all of you, uh, Mr. Verrett, uh, Mr. Pat, both of you. Uh, the full-throated endorsement of risk management tools, I very much appreciate that. And I think we need to do, we meaning us, need to do a better job of articulating that to our constituents about why they're benefiting uh, from these programs. Because it seems like it only comes home to, uh, to roost, no pun intended, when you see what happened to egg prices and things that are going on up there. Now people start paying attention to the, these things that happen. So that's why I think this hearing is important. I want to just ask just a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Brantley, I. Uh, the chairman has been great helping me uh, understand rice more. It's a different, uh, it's a different animal than, than uh, some of the crops we see out in Minnesota. But this actively engaged prov provision, I did want to bring that up and maybe go to uh, some of the other producers, how it impacts them, because again, it's that not the one size fits all. Comment period closed last week. It's a proposed rule. Uh, what advice would you give us as, as we try and get this thing right? You know, I think uh, this committee uh, set a standard of what a family farm is, and I think the comment period of what I see the USDA asking is for comment on what a family farm should be and who uh, should participate as a family farmer, uh, which is uh, complete opposite of what this committee asked in the last farm bill. Uh, you know, we are a family farm. I do have one partner who is a non-family member who's been on our farm for 25 years. Uh, just because we have one non-family member, then cre the way the, the proposal from the USDA reads is now my farm is, family farm is no longer exempt for that family farm status. Uh, so I would look at this committee and ask, you know, who's supposed to define that? I would hope that this committee can uh, work with the USDA to, to, to keep the family farms the way they are, keep the actively engaged rules the way they were, and, and not let them change it off of a comment period. Is that, is this unique to Rice, or Kevin, does this, are you hearing this from our folks out there? Is it a little different on how the structuring is? Because I know they're not all structured the same. Well, it's, it's those, uh, those uh, family partnerships or those operations that have somebody not involved in the family. And that many times is the case where there's someone that is not a family farmer, not a member of the family uh, in that operation. So uh, there'll be many family farms uh, that it, it might not have any impact on, but there will be some. I guess my answer is the same, Mr. Uh, Waltz, it depends. Okay. Well, we appreciate it. Now's the time for us to speak out on this, so I very much appreciate that, and we're very interested in making sure we get that part right. If I could go on to uh, ask the witnesses now, it's kind of a reflection period here where we just closed out the software and we had the first uh, sign-up period on ARC and PLC. Uh, what's your impressions on how that, how that went, how the process went? I guess we're not going to know the impacts of those programs uh, for a while, but if some of you could give your impact on the, or your input on that on how it hit your guys. 
You know, it, it, I'm familiar with two county offices in the Boot Hill of Missouri, Dunklin and Pemiscott counties, and the, the, the employees of the Farm Service Agency did a tremendous job of getting people in and getting, getting work through the process. I, I, it, as complicated as the farm bill was for them to be able to be educated and get all the producers in and signed up, I think they did yeoman's work at, at USDA. I can't say enough good about the Farm Service Agency at the local level. Good. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, I would just, uh, I, I've had the good fortune of, of knowing Deputy Secretary Krista Harden for, for over 20 years, and I would just uh, echo the, uh, the comments I put in my uh, February 19th email to her. I arrived at uh, my local FSA at 2.02 p.m. I waited 45 minutes, which I knew I did. I didn't have an appointment. I walked in. I sat down at one of the seven desks at the Blue Earth County FSA. Took me 12 minutes to update my yields. Took me six minutes to sign up for the ARC County. It by far, with the technology and the preparation, was the easiest farm bill I've signed up for in my farming career. I wish Health and Human Services had listened to them, but uh, thank you. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for that. It's, it's good stuff. If we get some other folks asking questions, I want to end with, and because I think it's something, trying to explain this risk management to our constituents I think is is really something we need to keep focusing on because it is too critical to allow the politics to uh, to undermine it in any way I yield back uh, thank the gentleman recognize the com full committee chairman mr. Conway well thank you mr. chairman I appreciate that uh, one quick question for mr. Verrett uh, Steve in your written testimony and also in your world test made reference to uh, the traditional crop insurance was not designed to meet any competitive practices by our trading partners, but were in fact were designed for low yields, drought, um, weather impacts, revenue swings, that kind of thing. Can you expand on that for us as to how that what how that works or doesn't work? Well, crop insurance is primarily uh, to protect on yields, but certainly the revenue products are very important. But they only account for change of price within a crop year. Uh, you know. If, if it starts out kind of low to begin with, there's not much protection offered. And that's, that's what's happened in cotton. And I mean, when we're talking about the things that are going on in the international markets, and specifically what I mentioned about China and their, their effect on the world market and what's happening, crop insurance can't, can't account for that. It just can't. It does a great job. It's very necessary on protecting me on yield loss and revenue loss within that year. But it's not... It was never intended to be in place for long term or extended low prices. And that's what lots of times happens with, with some of the international problems we have. Appreciate that. Mr. Brantley, uh, you mentioned trade with Cuba and selling rice to those guys. Can you walk us through what the current state of affairs is with respect to what, what's the barrier to uh, selling rice to, to Cuba right now? We're waiting on uh, the word go from our U.S. government. Uh, well, isn't it really just a financing issue, though? That's been, I mean, you can, you can sell rice now if you take the, uh, if you can get, convince the Cubans to pay you way ahead of time, right? Well, through a third party is the way I understand it. Uh, and it, we did that uh, in 2000, last time we did it in 2006, somewhere in that neighborhood, but uh, through, a, through a third party, uh, which was uh, something that did not work. Okay. Um, selling whatever commodity to Cuba, would it be better to be able to sell to just the, the government-owned entity uh, that's, uh, that's your one contact, or would it be better to sell to co-ops and, and others across uh, all of Cuba that might spread the wealth? It's a leading question. You know, that's tough to answer. I think the first thing you do is start selling to the, to the government entity. To the government, the, the entity that's run by the, the uh, yeah. Communist Party. Just to start the process. The yeah. And then, and then let uh, the fair trade take over from there. Yeah. I, I believe if you start, we start selling commodities to Cuba, there, there will well, be... Well, we're selling now. We just have some artificial barriers that came with the Bush administration that, that make it really difficult, right? We haven't sold any rice since yeah. that 2006. I right, appreciate that. Mr. Uh, Chairman, you go back. I thank the Chairman and recognize the gentleman from uh, Nebraska for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman, I'm happy to see you're a graduate of Iowa State. My, uh, my son Tom is enrolling in Iowa State this year, so uh, sort of excited in our family for that. Um, 
Me, if I could just ask you, and thanks for coming, and, and I think your testimony is is interesting. And I we I did note from our uh, local paper, the Omaha World Herald, a couple of weeks ago, referenced the fact that Nebraska was the one state in the country uh, that did not see an increase uh, in personal income from 2014 or 13 to 14. So it is uh, related, obviously, to, to, to ag and, and prices, and uh, I understand that. Uh, <clears throat> from, a, from a banking perspective, a banker's perspective, what, what are, as we look forward out five years, let's say, what are the, um, the benchmark, uh, you noted a few of them in your uh, charts here, but what are the benchmarks you look at as we go out five years to think about how we can plan uh, for the future in ag in our state and across the country. What are you looking at, uh, good and bad, uh, in evaluating the future out five years? Uh, as was noted in some earlier testimony, it, it depends somewhat on the crop sector versus the livestock sector. There, we have seen um, extremely high profits in 2014 in some of Nebraska's livestock sector. Uh, when you talk to bankers, and this is true for Nebraska, I think, as well as surrounding states that, that do depend relatively more on agriculture, there's a strong emphasis and growing emphasis on working capital and liquidity. As has been noted in some of the testimonies, farm income has been projected to decline 43 percent from 2013. Uh, I would note that that's still relatively an average with the, the long-term average that's on trend with the long-term average, but it is a sharp reduction from 2013. So many bankers are noting that that's an, adju an adjustment in agriculture, recognizing that to get through this setback, producers will need to focus on work working capital, maintaining liquidity, uh, looking at balance sheets, thinking very carefully about efficiency and cutting costs whenever possible. So I think that's the focus for agriculture. And as you noted, there are a lot of industries that directly and indirectly then de depend on agriculture. And, and thank you. And how uh, the comment was made about uh, looking forward to the fifth generation in farming, uh, in, in his family, uh, which is very, very neat, by the way, is to, uh, I'm a fifth generation Nebraskan, and, and it's a, important to have that continuity. Uh, as the, the difference between um, small farms, and it was referenced in earlier testament, small, or not small farms, but, but uh, young farmers uh, getting into the business versus uh, others, uh, and the, the, the difficulties that they have. Can, can you ex express that a little bit from the financial perspective? Sure. So there, for young farmers they, that have been getting into the business, say, in the past three to five years when land prices were rising and other prices of agric agricultural commodities and input costs were rising, that is a, a difficult environment to get into a business. So for young producers, that's, that's been a difficult, uh, difficult position. Um, I think that bankers would also say that, that young farmers typically have a harder time simply because they haven't had the years of equity that many of the older operators have had in terms of building up, uh, you know, low debt to asset ratios, maybe owning the farmland outright and not being dependent on, let's say, cash rents on a year-to-year -year basis that also then present their own level of risk. So when we're looking ahead five years or ten years and we see that situation with the younger farmers, how does that play out then? What needs to happen? Uh, you need to, uh, prices need to go up, obviously, but what needs to happen to, to get us to a place where the younger farmers can, uh, can start to get the benefit of some of the, what their parents had. I, I think right now the environment that we're in is low profit margins and efficiency is ultimately being emphasized. So it could take some time, it could take some adjustment uh, for young farmers to be able to get to the point where uh, they've maybe realized scale that's sufficient enough to uh, to get some of the, the benefits of those of, of better profit margins. But for right now, I think it's just a time of, of sort of looking very carefully at where they can cut costs in an environment when costs have remained relatively high. Thanks. I yield back. Thanks, Richard. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize uh, the distinguished chairman emeritus, the gentleman from Oklahoma, for five minutes. That's a very polite way of saying the old guy, and I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, I started uh, farming in 1977 thanks to my maternal grandfather's willingness to co-sign a lease on an old war-out farm and to co-sign a note at the bank. Being underage, I wasn't old enough to do that on my own. So by the mid-1980s, I'd still not purchased any land, but I watched what happened when the world fell out from under all of us. Let's talk for a moment about the circumstances now compared to then. In the mid-1980s, 
Uh, we've gone through a run-up in land prices, most of it financed by debt, most of it financed by the most amazing leveraging of assets to get there. And when the air went out of the balloon, it took out an entire generation. Compare, and you mentioned the cooling in land prices, compare the circumstances now with the 1980s. I mean, how much of this increase in land value and land purchases have been financed with equity now, for instance, versus debt or almost total debt in the 1970s and early 80s? I think there is a distinction, and you mentioned some similarities, and when you look at the early 1980s coming out of the 1970s, certainly we had a run-up in farm income, uh, run-up in farmland values, and, and to that extent we've seen some of those similar signs today. Uh, you mentioned leverage, though, and that's one of the differences. When you look at measures of debt-to-asset ratios, as an example, it's been at about 10.6% in 2014. It's expected to maybe tick up a little bit in 2015. So on average, leverage is not being used as extensively as it had been in the late 1970s. With that being said, there, of course, as you've, you've had some consolidation in the farm sector, that does mean that credit exposure at an individual level, level would be higher. And you and Mr. Combs as bankers will understand that the, the big difference is interest rates. I mean, we, we don't have 18 or 20 percent interest that, you know, the farmer told me Jesus Christ himself couldn't pay 20 percent interest. So, and I mean, it, remember it, part of the hook difference. in the early 80s was we went from price controls on interest rates that dated back to the 1930s to turning them loose. I borrowed cow feed money at 17% and was so happy to get it and had so much equity at the time, but that's just what the rate was. That said, if we were to continue to see a downturn in land prices, younger farmers, being farmers, just as in the 70s and 80s, would be hurt, would be under pressure. But a lot of pressure this time or a lot of the loss would be sustained by older established farmers, correct, who've used that equity in the last five years to purchase those farms. They'd still have the land, they just would have a different balance sheet. Fair statement? That's a fair statement because the banks, the rural, the, the rural banks and the farm credit system, the life insurance companies and, and, uh, that loan money in our area have been much more stringent in their underwriting requirements and their uh, appetite for the amount of leverage they would allow on a farm. So if the, as the values have gone down, the people still own the land, but it's just that their balance sheet, their net worth has shrunk, if for lack of a better term. So we did learn from the pain of 40 yes. years ago. Mr. Barrett, you and I are from a region of the country where we have an extra issue on top of all of these. Five miserable weather years in a row. Now, the weather's changed, at least in my part of the great southwest. I think I see some clouds passing over your folks on the radar screen, too. I don't know what that's done to your planning program for the spring and summer, but I see the weather change. Describe for a moment. Crop insurance never makes anyone 100% whole. Describe to us a moment what the last five years have done to producers, not only in cotton, but in the other commodities in your region of the country. Well, as you mentioned, crop insurance was never intended to, you know, fully replace a crop. I will say, you know, we were fortunate if, if we were going to have had the drought when we did, especially in 2011 and 12, from a cotton perspective, was one of the highest prices that we had for mm -hmm. cotton. We didn't grow any one able to sell it, but that was reflected, as I mentioned earlier to Mr. Conaway, in crop insurance because it was high, it did help come a lot closer to replacing that crop not having. As you well know, though, no one insures in, part, in our part of the world, in Texas and Oklahoma, if you get to 70%, you're, you're on the high end of insurance, and most of our guys are in that 55 to 65 range. So you still have a significant amount of your cost unprotected, no matter what the price is. So yes, it has started raining, and we're, we're, we're very blessed with that, but as I said to my son, it, it brings a new set of challenges. And we start with a five-year period coming out of where we would have, we have not had the crops we would have had at those prices, missed opportunities. We're in a different position than some of our neighbors maybe who had five great years That's and right. deal with challenges. That said, one last question. Uh, what do you say to one of my colleagues or somebody in the house who says, well, if cotton's not a good deal, go raise something else? <laughs> well, you, you know very well Mr. Lucas, that, you know, our part of the world gets about from 18 to 20 inches of rainfall, and, you know, we don't, we don't have the good fortune to be able to plant corn or, or soybeans. Sorghum is an alternative. Wheat certainly is an alternative. But for the great preponderance of our area, cotton is the best choice. And plus, there's a, 
You know, you mentioned about what's happened with the drought. The big, one of the biggest effects of the drought over the last several years is the infrastructure. You know, producers have been able to weather it, thank goodness, to crop insurance. But if you're a cotton gin or you're a cotton uh, oil mill press or, or, or just a business that's supplying inputs to those farmers, they're the ones that's been hurt the most. And so, you know, we've got that infrastructure. As, as uh, a guy told me one time that owned a cotton gin, he says he hadn't figured out a way to run grain sorghum through that cotton gin yet. And so that's, we're very invested in the cotton industry, and it is the best fit for our area as well. Mr. Chairman, if you indulge me for 10 more seconds, what Mr. Verrett's saying about cotton is a reflection of many of the commodity groups raised across the country. They are raised because of the nature of the soil, the weather, the climate, the circumstances. It's not just an accident that you raise corn in Indiana or cotton in, uh, in Texas, that part of Texas, or wheat in western Kansas. It's not an accident. It is the best fit. you back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well said. Appreciate that. Uh, pleased to recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to keep the line of questioning on as uh, Chairman Lucas was talking about, and that's cotton. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but my state of Georgia is the second largest producer of uh, cotton, second only to Texas. So I want to focus uh, my comments on that. As you know, the cornerstone of the farm bill was the insurance, crop insurance programs. And we got the agricultural risk coverage, ARC, where payments are triggered when actual county crop revenue falls below a certain percentage. Then we have the price loss coverage, where payments are triggered when the price of crop falls below its reference price. But then we got stacks. This is the new deal. And cotton is coming under it for the very first time. And I've always had some concerns about that to make sure we treat our cotton producers very fairly. But there's one area where our cotton producers are not being treated fairly, and particularly in my state of Georgia, which I like to kind of focus on. The, the, the issue is this. Uh, for this current year, um, regarding cotton and stacks, there is great concern uh, in my state of Georgia in the way that this plan is moving forward. And I'm sure in other parts of this country they may also have some problems. Now, uh, uh, specifically, the concern is the way that counties are being grouped and assessed for tax payments. As many of you know, tax payments are triggered only when an area's average revenue falls. And oftentimes the areas used for evaluation are based on boundaries that typically fall within county lines. Oftentimes an area includes several counties that are grouped together. Now I have concerns that there are counties being grouped together and assessed for the same payment structure when in fact they do not share any form of the same boundary line, nor do they even experience the same weather pattern. And Mr. Vallad, you and Mr. Lucas just got through discussing how important weather patterns are to the production of cotton. For example, in my state of Georgia, there are cotton producer farms that are located in counties such as Morgan County or Walton or Coney, which are situated in the northern part of Georgia. However, these counties in the northern part of Georgia are being grouped and assessed for payments with counties to the south of uh, where they are located. It would seem to make sense for these counties to be grouped with producers' counties to the north, northwest, not to the south. This is particularly true in Georgia. It's almost like grouping uh, producers in New York and New Jersey with producers in Virginia. The weather pattern, my state is a large state. If any of you, as you watch the weather patterns and you watch the jet streams, there's a divide where that jet stream comes right through middle Georgia, south of Atlanta. And when you get that way, north of Atlanta is in the mountains, is up. In the south, you're more acquainted with, associated with Florida and that area. 
So, so what I'm asking for here, and Mr. Elliot, is for you, if you could comment on this, and um, if other members on the panel have similar issues within their own states, their own areas. I know when, when the Stacks program was put together, and it's the same for SCO as well, they're both, as such, area-wide trigger programs. Uh, the idea was, and I can't say that I'm absolutely familiar with Georgia, I know the theory you're talking about, what you're talking about, but there had to be a certain amount of acres in a county for it to stand on its own, basically. And if it wasn't enough, then they were supposed to go to like or go out, they had like a circle, they went out to adjoining counties. I'm not aware of any counties that were joined together, you know, in one region of the state and then not be contiguous, but that may very well be the case. What I would say to you, Mr. Scott, is that I know that the National Cotton Council, I served on a committee uh, in helping implement stacks. The, they stand ready to work with you, and I know that their staff would be more than willing to visit with you and then go to USDA. We've, we've been really trying to have a very close working relationship with the Risk Management Agency in trying to make this program work as good as it can. Right, well, well thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanna, wanna make a point. Even when you get the Bo Weevil involved, the occurrence and the variations of that insect being impacted is dictated by the weather. And from North Georgia, South Georgia, is a 25, 30 degree separation. So I, I would just like to ask if our committee could go on record to encourage the uh, Department of Agriculture to more specific, and more specifically the Risk Management Agency to take a serious look at this so that we can make sure that we're treating our cotton producers fairly in Georgia and other parts of the country might have this problem. Absolutely, I'm very committed to working with you on that. I appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nagabauer, for five minutes. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Brett, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about stacks, and uh, one of the things that we're hearing, and I think you and I have had this conversation, is the participation rate seems to be pretty low in, in stacks. Uh, and uh, stacks was designed to kind of be the alternative, I guess, uh, when, due to the fact that you know cotton lost a lot of its commodity uh, title uh, support. Can you kind of elaborate on why you sense that a lot of producers are, are don't don't find stacks to be uh, uh, beneficial for? I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, I think it is area based, as you well know, so it's not dependent on you. It's uh, depending on what happens in the county. I think the fact that we had started getting rain and our, our situation looked better than it had for a number of years. Also, the, the county expected revenue is based upon the last several years, and because of the drought, that's down very low. So the target revenue for stacks was low, especially on dry land, on non-irrigated, and you could, could separate between non-irrigated and irrigated. So I just think, plus the price was uh, not that great to begin with, so I just think most people opted, especially non-irrigated, to just buy more le uh, underlying coverage. I think that's one, of the, that's one of the main reasons, was because coming out of the drought. I just think an unfamiliarity, most people are just, you know, when they buy crop insurance, whether it's hail insurance or underlying insurance, it's on their farm. Even though more people are using enterprise units and becoming more familiar with it, and I think as time goes on, this will be another tool. I still think it's a good tool. It can protect you, especially from catastrophic price risk. Uh, it's, it's almost like buying a put option is what it's almost like. But the main thing, the low participation, was just the fact we, we're coming out of a drought and the, and the prospect looks so good. Yeah, there's been some discussion too about you know farmers being able to get financing and uh, you know certainly hearing uh, that uh, from, even from my banker friends that uh, you know the farmers that are coming in or uh, have after particularly in our area that have been uh, subject to this drought for three or four years and really had like you said and I think some of the other witnesses been able to bank any reserves. What, what are you seeing uh, 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 from a perspective of this been much more difficult this year to to get. Uh, financing for your operations? Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, you know, I, like Kevin, I talked to a couple of bankers and some equipment dealers before coming and putting my testimony together. Uh, you know, I had one equipment dealer tell me that 
he had nine producers that were still waiting on decisions about operating loans for 2015. And those were all FSA decisions. They're, they're borrowers that were waiting on decisions out of FSA. I, it, there's no doubt that that's the case. There's significant carryover in the business. And, and there's some that's not. You know, it's not like cotton, uh, you know, the, as I said, the irrigated cotton farmers over the last several years that have been able to take more advantage of some of the price have done better than the non-irrigated guys that didn't have a crop. So it's not like it's been total doom and gloom in the cotton business, but it's just been tough. But even those that have been successful in getting financing, most of those folks are eating into their own equity to do that. I mean, the only reason they were able to, to pay out in after 14 was they put a bunch of their money in on the front end before they started borrowing money and they just didn't have as much to pay back but this is why this year is going to be critical uh, I, I appreciate the questions of mr. Lucas about the 80s and there's no doubt it's not what it was in the 80s mainly because of what Paul said I that's when I started farming and the interest rate differences but I can tell you as well though that you know where land prices have gone and they haven't escalated near in our part of the world as they have in lots of the country. They've escalated pretty well, and those are going to be tough. If people weren't buying with equity, uh, it's going to be a tough situation if they're leveraged very much on that land as, as we go on the next few years. Thank you. Mr. Collins, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, 179, and one of the things that I think was frustrating to a lot of uh, producers uh, in my district and, and even small businesses, not just uh, agriculture, was the fact that, you know, uh, we uh, didn't uh, do anything on that until till the very end of the year, and, and, and obviously uh, a lot of people are trying to make some some buying and and, and, and de decisions on investments. Whether you know, and to tell, can you kind of just articulate how important it is to have some stable tax policies so that you as a as the implement dealer, but also as your as your uh, customers can make those capital decisions. Well, the, the, the scale of farming has gotten so much bigger that customers tend to plan their purchases uh, well in advance. And, and what we saw is that the year before it had been extended earlier in the year. And so people, after the crop was produced, say at the end of September, they knew that they had the ability to use the 179 deduction and determine whether they're going to make purchases at the end of 2013. In 2014, we had some people, particularly these people that had their crops hedged, that, that, that had the ability to make the purchases but they, they were wanting to take advantage of 179 and they just weren't sure it was going to be there. We kept hearing, we kept getting word back that from DC that they're going to get it done, they're going to get it done, but the, the, I guess they'd seen enough stuff not get done that they were skeptical of that. And we had some people that would have purchased otherwise that absolutely didn't because it didn't happen until the very end of December. And so our message is if we can get it stable or if we can at least know where we are by the, by the uh, uh, beginning of the fourth quarter, it would really help us. I uh, thank the gentleman and recognize the gentlelady from Arizona for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to ask one follow-up question to the land prices and the rent prices. So we keep hearing that they're uh, going up. My question is for all the panelists, if you could just tell me what's happening in your region. Are rent prices and land prices up, down, flat? Uh, do you see a trend? Uh, and if you do, what that trend is. So we'll start here. Thank you very much. Land prices uh, certainly have not come down uh, like uh, commodity prices have or other uh, import prices have not come down. Um, land rents, it kind of depends how you treated your landlords in the good years. Those farmers, those uh, renters that uh, made a little more money than they expected, so they shared that with their, their landlords as a bonus or are flexible. Uh, um, now, as things are tighter, that we're, we're losing 50 to $100 an acre, um, those landlords are very much more willing to uh, negotiate on those rents. Um, those that didn't share the good, in the good times um, that still have contracts, uh, those landlords are, are holding us to those contracts. And do you see any trends? Um, the, the trend we'll see is they will have to go down and it, it might take the bankers to tell us there's no way you're going to pay that for rent. We don't like to give up. I have usually about one opportunity a lifetime um, as we look at area farms in, in our neighborhood. Um, as farmers, we never like to give up land and we always, you know, are looking at the opportunities in the future. But uh, 
Um, there's going to be some that land is going to, as it was explained to me by a farm management instructor, there's going to be a fruit basket upset it, that we're going to see here soon. Yes, please. Uh, land prices in our area uh, have not come down. Uh, if anything, they've gone up the uh, first quarter of 15. Uh, for, for crop rents in Arkansas, we're predominantly crop share, so those adjust uh, year in, year out. Uh, the, the, the land that's been selling the last few years in Arkansas is the, it's the unimproved farms, the, the less desirable farms. The good farms haven't sold. Uh, I'd hate to know what they would bring today, uh, but it, it, you would think with the prices and the reckoning that uh, is coming, uh, that uh, land prices have to come down some. Do you see any trends in that direction right now? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, land prices in our part of the world have not gone up as much as certainly the Midwest and even the Mid-South, but they did increase uh, pretty significantly. I do not see they. I would say they're flat. No one. Is, they're not continuing to go up. All of our uh, rental agreements are crop share rental agreements. There's very little, if any, uh, cash rents in my part of the world because it's just too risky. Nobody can lay out a guaranteed amount. But I can tell you, uh, there's already talk beginning between landowners and operators on, on adjusting rental agreements, and they're gonna have to be adjusted. But and in a crop share, it's basically, they have to take on, the owners have to take on more of the share of the inputs than what they're doing today. With seed costs, very few landowners pay seed costs. Seed cost is about $70 to $80 an acre now to plant cotton. That's one of the biggest costs we have up front. So there, uh, there's gonna have to be uh, some adjustment or there's going to be uh, there's folks are just not going to be able to do it if prices don't improve well as you know cotton is a, is a big crop in Arizona yes, and so my cotton farmers are dealing with this and uh, thank you uh, in our area uh, the land prices have softened anywhere from 10 to 15 percent rents have come down and the only thing that hadn't forced the land down further is the uh, low interest rates in other words the lack of return that institutional investors can get for their money somewhere else. There's been a lot of institutional money that has bought bought big tracts of land for cash. And as those institutional investors can buy can do something better with their money, then that, that could pose a risk to the to the price stability of land in our area. Thank you. I have about thirty seconds left. Thank you. I would say in, in our area, Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, and heart, in the heart of the Corn Belt, we are starting to see land prices soften on the order of about 10%. Cash rents have maybe been a bit slower to adjust, um, and has been, as has been noted with uh, cost being an important determinant of profitability, that's an area where over time there could very well be further pressure on cash rents and farmland values to, to adjust to the lower profit margins. Thank you, panelists. Thank you very much for your testimony, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. lady recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to continue along that same line, but before I do, Mr. Barrett, I want to go back to what you said about the low commodity prices. Uh, cotton, for example, uh, being as low as it is, that's cotton pickers that don't sell at the tractor dealership. That's cotton gins that don't run as much cotton through, and I think it's important that we understand that uh, when commodity prices go down, it doesn't just affect the farmer. It affects the whole community and uh, as someone who's from Georgia who represents 25 counties the the largest part of the economy and the majority of the counties that I represent is is at farm gate value and so when these commodity prices go down it has tremendous impacts on uh, local school systems uh, the hospitals uh, it, it, it affects everybody uh, in that area and so certainly concerned about that but I want to go back to the, the last comments. You know, it used to be that when you were looking at um, buying the land next door that you were competing with the person who maybe lived on the other side of the land. And now, uh, as you alluded to, you're not competing uh, with them as much as you're competing with pension plans or other uh, people who are, who are investing uh, not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, but in some cases, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and certainly I think that's changed the dynamic of um, land values. And so, Dr. Kaufman, as you mentioned in your written testimony, uh, with land prices softening, uh, we, we hear uh, in many cases that prices are still incredibly high. Uh, 
how much of that do you attribute to pension plans now uh, uh, and, and other commercial investors like that uh, purchasing land? Uh, do you see a bottom falling out of this? And uh, just, a, a, I mean, how do they, in those pensions, how do they mark their books with the value of that property if that property value falls? I think that there has been there has been some investor interest in farmland, certainly in, in large parts of the Corn Belt as well. I would say, though, more recently, uh, much of the the farmland that's been selling uh, in our area throughout the Corn Belt has been predominantly from from farmer interest. Uh, so it's typically farmers that are looking at their own operations and long term planning and thinking about uh, you know that being an opportunity that might not come along all that often. So much of the activity more recently has been uh, for farmers that may even be willing and in a financial position to be able to pay a premium for land that uh, they consider to be a very good opportunity. I know that I know that the foundation of our local college purchased a farm in, in Texas, for example. So a, a Georgia College Foundation buying a farm in Texas uh, because they felt like it was a better investment than bonds. And I guess if your bond values fall, you have to reflect that uh, at least on an annual basis. But do they have to reflect the the variances in land prices? Uh, that, that may well differ depending on the, on the specific case that you're referencing, but I think that uh, you know, in, in investors and others are looking at many of the same things that others are looking at in the investment world and thinking about where they may get attractive returns, and certainly there has been attractive returns in, in agriculture production over the course of the past five years. So one of the, uh, that's because commodity prices have been good, and now that they're, now that they're not so good, I, it's going to be interesting to see if that continues. One of the things that concerns me about the President's budget that he put forward our committee, especially with regard to ag lending, is that he proposes to take away a lot of the participating loans and move them to uh, direct loans from uh, FSA. In, instead of uh, they, them being uh, guaranteed, if you will, where your local bankers participate in that. Um, could, could you speak to that and, and why, why would he propose that? Doesn't that, by definition, take capital out of, the, uh, out of those loans if the local bank was going to participate? Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question, but I think that I wouldn't want to speculate as to what some of the decisions were behind that, but uh, certainly the FSA has been involved in some of that. Well, Mr. Mr. Combs, you're on the bank board, aren't you? Yeah, the, the FSA wouldn't have the staff. In, in our area, uh, FSA on the subordinations and the guarantees, uh, a lot of the banks will work up the loans and, and get FSA's blessing on it on a subordination mm -hmm. or participation. and. Uh, you know, we got two guys full time in the Dunklin County office, and I think one full time in, in the neighboring county. It, they couldn't handle. You'd have to ramp up the employees to the point that I'm I'm not sure of the savings that would accrue back to the government after you got done hiring people. And then the thing that will happen is if they're not efficient about the way they do it, the people will be out of business before, the, the, you know, when the loan doesn't get made. Mr. Combs, I'm out of time, but I I think that that proposal kind of. Uh, was short-sighted in what they put forward, and uh, I certainly hope that we keep uh, more of the participating and guaranteed loans instead of the direct lending. At, at, <laughs> but you know, it's not the farm guys up here that say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, it seems to me in Washington, if it ain't broke, you go meddle with it. The gentleman's time has expired. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. LaMalfa Rice Farmer. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, from the uh, number one rice growing district in the country, evidently here, so I appreciate it. Um, you know, a, a subtext of this uh, committee, or maybe a different committee hearing, would be an update on the mental health of California's water policy. I mean, uh, no storage built since really the 70s, well, really more the 60s in California. Uh, 15,000 acre feet released the other day to help six fish go down the stream. Uh, which thanks a lot to uh, Bureau of Reclamation and the Endangered Species Act. We have uh, much, much ag land already idled in our state because they're letting it all run out to the ocean pretty much. Yet the New York Times, for example, still claims in editorials that 80% of California's water is used for agriculture. They don't count of the whole 100% that 50% goes for enviro water or just letting it run out to the ocean. 40% is for ag and the other 10% is for cities. 
So a lot of frustration with that. Um, people are now starting to take the, the idea that in California that, uh, well, we're farming this desert anyway. We should, shouldn't be using water for that. We're just, we're exporting our water because we're exporting almonds, exporting rice, exporting uh, uh, the truck crops, the vegetable crops, and all that. We should keep that here. So the mentality seems just grow your own garden, evidently. So uh, a lot of frustration about that. So when, when you add all this up together, the exports are bad. That, uh, well, for the, for the purposes of hearing, I guess there's really no amount of risk management or crop insurance that can fix that kind of stupid, right? So a lot of frustration. But getting back to what, uh, what we're working on here today, um, is that uh, our own government's trade policy, I'd like to direct this to Mr. Mr. Brantley. You, you were uh, concerned about, uh, um, in regards to our, our trade here, that uh, we, uh, well, we're not, we're not doing enough. Um, in, in the TPP that's coming up, for example, what, what is the value of TPP going to be if, if not uh, some of the issues involved with uh, the negotiations? How, how's this going to look for U.S. rice, whether it's Arkansas rice, California rice, uh, in, in, uh, in concert with what you said in your testimony a little bit earlier? How, how's that looking to you? If, the, if we are not allowed to increase rice sales to Japan, it is of no value. Uh, that's part of these negotiations, and that's the one thing that Japan keeps holding out. Uh, and we are, we, USA Rice, is in support of TPP only if we can get increased sales of rice to Japan. Uh, the only, there is another issue that you have with the, I believe, the bilateral agreement is Mexico and Vietnam are in discussions. We have no idea where that is going, but if Vietnam is allowed to come in to, with their rice duty free, uh, that is the number one export for southern long grain rice. So we have a lot of issues at hand. We are in support of trade negotiations. Fair trade, I believe, is the best way for us to move our commodities around the world. So since our newspapers in California say we shouldn't export anymore because uh, we're exporting water, you have too much water there, so it'd be pretty important for our... be glad to give you some, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll be happy to run the pipe over there. <laughs> okay. Um, has your... Operation been impacted by, by RME's decision not to off, offer a rice revenue crop insurance policy for 2015. Say that again. Uh, when the RMA didn't get the uh, rice revenue crop insurance policy ready for 2015, how, how were you impacted on that on your operation or, or your neighbors that you're hearing about? Well, it, it, it uh, excluded us from participating. Uh, the story's yet to be told. How low will the price of rice be? depending on where we thought that spring price should have been. Uh, it, it, you know, rice is so thinly traded, we're always the, it seems that we're always the last commodity to participate in whatever the next program should be. Uh, I, I hear you. Um, and we needed it desperately. Uh, rice is, uh, price has gone down dr dramatically, and I think if we had a revenue price, it would have paid off this year just from the price alone, not, not necessarily the yield, but just from the price alone. When you think about insurance for rice and our yields are so stable, rarely do we have a claim on uh, an insurance policy. Yeah, yield, yield, yield isn't the problem, it's usually price. Always on price. Same thing in California as well. 2016, if we're not looking at some amazing weather this year, I don't, I don't know what we're looking at in any ag, uh, ag in California. So, uh, Mr. Combs, real quick. Um, um, you mentioned the 179 program. I'm sorry, we don't move faster around here, but I was able to tell some of my growers who'd call me, hey, Doug, uh, you guys are going to get that thing renewed this year? And I told them, I think so. I think you can figure that Congress will get that done. But you need a little more predictability, so um, we'll try and do better on that in the future. And I've, I've used my time out. I might come back to you in the second round of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, time has expired. Recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Boss, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would, uh, if I could, I'd like to ask Mr. Combs a few questions, uh, uh, mainly because you're the, one of the panel there that's the closest to my home. I can throw a rock across the river and down We have a dealership there. right across the river. From yes, you A lot of customers in Illinois. <laughs> well, and that's what I want to ask you about. On these dealerships, you know, I can look around and, and whether it's over on your side of the river or my side of the river, there's a lot of equipment setting. And waiting to, be, waiting to be purchased, yeah. 
And what I'm needing to find out is with these lower prices, what are you hearing from the lenders on any suggestions or any encouragement into, are, are people willing to even take the risk to purchase new equipment? It's on an individual basis. Most, if, if the customer had a good year in 2014, the, the lenders have been very willing to uh, allow purchases. We've had a couple of cases uh, dealership-wise where we were dealing with customers, and I've seen it on the bank side where the, the, the customer paid out in 2014, but they didn't have a big cushion, and the, the banks advised them not to purchase the equipment. And when you have lowering commodity prices, usually the equipment values follow along, and so you, you're in a situation where you've got equipment values that are falling, you need to be selling it to people who may be being told by their bankers not to buy it. So it, it, it's kind of a catch-22. The equipment will get worked through the system, but there's an excess, of particularly of used equipment, sitting out there. Well, yeah, and that's for used equipment. For new equipment, and and have you and, and because I'm a real stickler, I, I came from the trucking business, okay? And I don't like big government a lot. I really don't. I think we kind of overstep many things. What has happened to the price of equipment to try to meet a lot of the standards set forth as far as uh, EPA standards, other things as far as? The equipment has become more expensive in order to meet the emissions requirements. In, in other words, the, the, the equipment won't do any more than it would before, but the in, there's increased cost both in terms of the cost of the equipment and the cost of the def fuel that we have to, or the def fluid that we have to put in with the fuel to, in order to, uh, to meet the air standards, and that's that's true on uh, on uh, tractors and combines and things. It's also true on something like an irrigation power unit that you're just trying to run a well with. That th those those small units are having to meet those same emission requirements. Well, and, and I don't have many questions, but that that's the concern I have is is that once again, whether it's ag or whether it's the trucking business or every business that seems to be out there, we end up putting undue strain or un a heavy collar and a heavy burden on our producers when we're trying to compete in a worldwide market. Deer and case are building engines with, with, without those same standards to go in tractors in Brazil. So. Right, and, and then we're trying to compete on that level. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank the gentleman and recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Abraham, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, thank you guys for uh, coming. Uh, to me, our farmers, ranchers, foresters, uh, you are our national security now. The volume and the quality of the product that you grow is just unsurpassed. And uh, it's like I told the EPA when they were in my office when we were discussing the WOTUS and the Clean Water Act, there's not going to be any better conservationist or environmentalist or protector of the land than the American farmer or rancher. So like Mr. Boyst here, we, we need to get government out and, and let you guys do what you do best. I also still uh, live on the farm that I grew up on, so our family does farm, and I do realize that, you know, corn and soybeans of what we grow are down a couple of dollars a bushel, but uh, production cost, we're still costing about $200 an acre to fertilize that corn. So it's, it's tough, and I, I'm sure most of the general public understand, but maybe not all, that every time you guys go to work, it's like going to Vegas because you can have a pop-up thunderstorm today and you could get some straight line winds and you lay down a field of corn or a field of soybeans or a field of wheat and you've had a bad day. So, you know, we, we hope and we need to get that message out that, that what you do is very risky and, uh, you know, it's, it's very uh, touchy from day to day. And I'll start with my question, Mr. Red, while I'll start with you, but certainly any of you can answer this. In your testimony, you said that about $4 billion, I think, were paid by total farmers uh, in crop insurance uh, in the course of a year. But again, I think if we go back to a large city like D.C. that maybe others don't understand the percentage of liability insurance, workman's comp, insuring tractors, insuring tractor sheds, what percentage, if you don't mind, in your particular operation, does that play as far as its cost? It's got to be a large percentage, I'm sure. Uh, but for the average farmer, for yourself, how big of an issue is that? Are you asking how much crop insurance is? No, that sir. Um, well, that along with the workman's comp, because we, oh. know, we know in a farm workman's comp is very high because yeah. it's such a dangerous profession, but you've also got to insure your buildings, insure your tractors. Oh, yeah. uh, so how, how does that play into the, the overall picture? I, I suspect when you add 
all of my insurance, including crop insurance, which is part of risk management. It's all risk management. Uh, I'm, I'm having to talk off the top of my head, but I suspect it's going to be something in the range of 10 to 15 percent anyway. And that's all your profit right there, yeah, if you're lucky. Right. And Mr. Coons, I, I can tell you in, in our family that we farm a lot, we have delayed purchases of equipment and we usually have a two or three year lease that we roll over and we're not doing that this year because of the uncertainty. So you're exactly right. Uh, it's a big deal. And like Mr. Scott said, we have a Hollywood name actor that has purchased thousands of acres of land in our neck of the woods that has artificially kept land prices high and it has not allowed our farmers that need to purchase that land to do that, so investors are playing a big role. Mr. Brantley, I'll ask you a quick question. I have a great uh, friend uh, in Northeast Louisiana who grows a lot of rice, Mr. John Owens. Uh, you probably know him, but he's uh, been an invaluable resource to me as far as information on, on a lot of things. And we've talked about that in the rice, particularly the crop insurance, sometimes isn't a viable option. Uh, kind of going back to Mr. Barrett's idea, what other risk management tools do you use to mitigate some of your potential losses if you can't do the crop insurance? Uh, yeah, speaking, Mr. Owen, he is our producer group chairman and it's been oh, a great asset great. For, for me and all of us in the industry, but uh, what risk management tools do we have? We don't have many in the rice world. Uh, uh, we're eternal optimists. We right. have faith. That would be our biggest and risk management the farmers tool. and ranchers have yeah. always been um, eternal optimists. We, we don't participate in crop insurance because our yields are stable uh, and the cost has been too high. Uh, and we're only subject to price risk. We are subject to a drought, but we can overcome that, right, as you know. Yeah. Right. Um, so we're, our biggest risk is um, foreign governments. Okay. And uh, one quick, just follow up with Mr. Pam, Miss, uh, I, in my previous life was a veterinarian, so I understand the turkey and the uh, poultry cycle, but would you in the, just a few seconds just reiterate how important that cycle is for future production cycles? I mean, it's just not the one year, is it? You know, we've been in agriculture, we always talk about the weather, think about the weather, worry about the weather, and it's no different with this bird flu. You know, we need some sunshine, some warm weather to help break that, but uh, um, the weather changes again, and we're gonna, you know, we'll be going through this again. So a uh, lot of concern, a lot of, uh, certainly not only financial anguish, but that emotional, that mental side is really taking a toll on our farmers. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman and recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our panel for uh, uh, enlightening us on this, uh, uh, on what you deal with out there every day. I, I too, grew up on a farm, and uh, uh, my, my father became a gentleman farmer for the same problems that uh, I'm hearing about here today. He went into education, and uh, uh, thank goodness for that, I guess. But uh, uh, obviously, our district is, uh, you know, we grow a lot of cotton. And uh, I've given a lot of thought, uh, in Mr. Brett, your testimony today about the, the, the state of the industry and then as your comment, uh, Mr. Brantley, about, uh, you know, our, our vibe, well, whether we make it or not depends on foreign governments. And, uh, you know, the thing I can't quite understand is that we grow the cotton and then we send it to Asia, and then they sell it back to us in the form of, uh, you know, I guess what I'm wearing here today. Uh, so we're at their mercy. Uh, and I know, you know, of course, the rice is another issue. But as far as cotton goes, I mean, we, sh we export 80% of our cotton. And I guess we buy it right back in some form or another. And the government, at the same time, is uh, you know trying to subsidize this. But then again, we we'll see what the foreign governments are doing. Have we have we talked about a solution to this? I mean, obviously, the textile industry is uh, well, it's just not present in my uh, in Georgia anymore. And uh, but it sounds like we've got to do something to uh, fix this problem. And that looks like we may have to look at the whole, the whole process, uh, because I think I read somewhere where we, I mean, we 
import back into the country 36% of what the world makes out there. So it looks like we're paying for it to go and then to come back. And, uh, you know, have we thought about that? Well, you're exactly correct. You know, uh, we grow at most about uh, 18 to 19 million in, in good years. This last year, I think about 14 to 15 million. But we regularly import into the U.S. in the form of textiles. All right. We use and consume either through imports or what we produce domestically, which isn't a whole lot, about 20 million bales of cotton. So it's not like we're producing more than what we even need to use in the United States. So, but it does because we don't have that manufacturing anymore. Those were also long ago. We still do a good bit of yarn spinning in the U.S. We're very efficient at that. Uh, but when it goes beyond that, certainly beyond the knitting and the weaving, it's, uh, we're not the low-cost producers by any means. But the solution, I think, is, you know, when it comes, is we have to have better trade agreements, more fair trade agreements. And, and quite honestly, I just, you know, I, I don't mean to, but this WTO deal, these multilateral agreements, uh, as I mentioned, rule of law is important in trade agreements, but I just don't know how we think that we can get all of these countries together that are of various economic levels, and we can all come together and all agree on everything at one time, and then one country can throw it completely out of whack. We need to be negotiating trade agreements that are good for both this country and the other country that we're doing business with. And, uh, you know, bilateral agreements are, to me, the, the most effective way to do those, or at least regional agreements. We've benefited uh, to a great extent through some of the Central American agreements and in, our, in our hemisphere from a cotton perspective. But it's not an easy answer, Mr. Allen. I don't, I don't have, but it, but it has to do with agreements and how we're going to treat each other and how those enforcements are going to be done. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Barrett, and uh, I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman, and uh, that will conclude our round of questioning. I just want to defer to the ranking member if he has any closing statements. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. I, I just, one more, if I could, just brief question to, to Dr. Kaufman, maybe it did. I think it feels like to all of us the last couple of weeks has kind of been EPA's mic drop moment. They let a lot of stuff out pretty fast, and uh, and now it's for us to see what that means. And and if I could, Dr. Kaufman, and just ask, could you explain from the Midwest perspective and where you're sitting on this the impact of biofuels on the broader financial uh, economy of farm country? Well, in terms of biofuels, no doubt that's been a significant demand factor for U.S. agriculture, particularly as, as corn is one of the main inputs for, for ethanol production. Uh, so over the course of the years, that's been a factor that has, uh, I think, boosted profitability and in general agriculture in our region. And so as you've seen some of those ethanol facilities and other forms of biofuel build out, that's also represented other forms of economic activity in those areas where uh, there may be jobs associated with ethanol production, for example, or trucking or um, any number of other jobs that might be related to producing ethanol. So there's certainly there's, there's an impact much in the same way there would be for production of other products that would rely on agriculture. And you probably haven't had time to assess the impact of the, the current proposal. Uh, the only thing I, I would add on that is to the extent that the, the mandate that, was, uh, that came out last week would, would have been uh, maybe a bit below what was originally proposed a number of years ago in terms of ethanol production. Um, but I would add there that uh, the ethanol industry has been producing ethanol, uh, even absent some of, those, some of those mandates, has been a relatively profitable industry. Um, so it's maybe a question more about what that means for the long term. Great. Well, I appreciate it. Well, I thank the chairman. I thank each of you. Very helpful. Uh, great insights. And, and I think it gives us uh, at least a place to start going forward as we talk to our constituents. I yield back. I uh, thank the gentleman. And uh, uh, before I close, just without objection, I'll recognize Mr. LaMalfa for a quick question. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. I just wanted to follow back up one more time, Mr. Brantley. Uh, as we're hearing on TPP, the proposal, the report is maybe 50 to 70,000 tons annually of limited new access to Japan for rice. Now, as I run those numbers, you know, we make about four tons per acre on my operation. Most of my neighbors do, somewhere around there. 
And so that would be about 12,500 acres worth of production would be the new big wide opening that be, they'd be having under TPP. Me and four or five other growers could fill that out. Uh, what, what, is that, what kind of faith does that put you in the, the value TPP in the, for U.S. rice? It, it's going to be hard to support at those levels. Um, we have to have a significant increase uh, for our industry to support that. Uh, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, it's only you and three others could, could produce that, uh, you know, but uh, we were left out of the Korean Free Trade Agreement. It appears that's happening here today. Uh, without a significant increase, uh, it will be hard for our industry to support it. I, okay, I hear you. Um, again, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate your indulgence on that. I just wanted to get that one shot in there. And um, Mr. Combs, we also feel your pain on the uh, idea that if we have a severe drought, you're not just going to be down 15% in your sales. I don't see how you sell anything on what, we're, what we got coming up on uh, on uh, what's what's coming down the pike. And I have I have me and others have come hunted tractors in your country before years ago because you guys don't wear them all out before you resell them. So we appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> I think the gentleman, and uh, before we close, um, Dr. Kaufman, I appreciate you being here today and giving us the sort of the economic perspective and on the dynamics of the farm economy. Uh, you don't have to answer this question. This is, this is primarily, uh, I want to get the feedback from our producers here. Uh, just one final question, and we've heard uh, a recurring theme today about government regulation, among other things, and that tends to be one of those topics that comes up any time we assemble a group of producers. But let me ask you this. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't get your perspective on WOTUS, on uh, waters, of the, waters of the U.S., so let me just ask you this individually. I'll start with you, Mr. Combs. Do you support or oppose the rule? And uh, would you support uh, repeal of the rule? Uh, I oppose the rule. I would support repeal. And uh, there's no, we've got farms in our family that have been in, in our family for over 100 years. We're, we're going to take care of that land. And, and we don't need somebody in Washington telling us how to dig a ditch on a farm to get rid of some water. Thank you, Mr. Verrett. Uh, we oppose the rule. And we would support uh, uh, legislation to repeal. Thank you, sir. Mr. Brantley. I would concur. Support the rule and uh, oppose the repeal. Uh, you, you Opposite. I, I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I agree with you, what these gentlemen said. I'm sorry. You know, it, uh, as Paul said, uh, we're, we're the greatest con conservationist around. We know what we're doing. Uh, we would like to work with uh, our, our, our agencies. Uh, to conserve water, to improve quality and quantity, and we have a pretty good track record at what we're doing. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Papp. You know, the driveway I drove out of last night was the same driveway our family used 116 years ago. Hopefully we're going to use it the next 116 years. Um, certainly water quality, air quality, soil quality is all, you know, top priorities for us in agriculture. Um, we, we don't believe from a Farm Bureau perspective, and personally, um, it's not the agency's job to do an end around Congress. That's the reason we have Congress, committees, hearings like this. Um, not, it's not the agency's job to create laws. Thank you, gentlemen. I want to, uh, again, extend our gratitude to you for being here today and appreciate your insights. I think this has been a very valuable hearing. and. Um, Appreciate you being here. Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplementary written responses from the witnesses to any questions posed by a member. This subcommittee on general farm commodities and risk management hearing is now adjourned. Thanks, Chairman. Yes, sir.